Hi everyone. In today's session we're going to be having a look at a function known as Clip History. Clip History works with Insider Smoke and it allows you to track all the creative processes that have been performed onto various media so that you're able to see exactly how it's been put together and to be able to track and sometimes alter the way the clips were created in the first place. Let's go ahead and have a look at how Clip History is actually enabled in the software. The first thing that you need to do is go into your Preferences menu. You will see under the General Options you've got Default Processing Options. This allows you to choose how you're going to set your processing mode. So by default you could be working with the Process option but you could also be telling the system to process and create clip history. In other words every single time you process a new clip it will create the history attached to that clip which allows you to trace all the steps that you're working with. Another option that you have is the ability to choose exactly what history is actually stored with the clip. So by default normally keep sources are turned on. That means it will keep the rendered version plus the original source that was used to create the result you have. You could also choose not to keep any sources which means you'll simply just have metadata and a rendered version. So you may have to make sure you can always get back to your sources or you can choose the option to keep all the intermediate renders you've created in order to get to the final result which you have now. So let's go ahead and have a look at some of the examples in which clip history can be used in the workflow. So basically here I've got a shot of a girl and this shot was then color corrected. You can see that the process was processed with history and then you can see that there's a text effect being applied. The one thing that's just worth pointing out is if I was simply to go into the text module with that clip you will see when we hit process in all the modules it's now defaulted to process plus history. This is simply because in our preferences menu the option was set to process and create history. But if I wanted to process a clip without any history attached to it you could choose through the pop-up menu to simply just process. So you don't have to always go back to the preferences menu to make that change. Now once we've got a clip with history we want to be able to see exactly how the clip was created. So for example if I was just to double tap on the H icon that we have here you will see that it tells me that that particular clip, so the one that's got the text effect and the color correction on it, has been through a series of different processes. You will now see as well that the icon is a light gray because in this case it was processed with the intermediate sources as well. Now if I wanted to look at this history and make a change to it we can alter the tools that were used to create the history. So in other words we can affect the color correction or the text. What we can't do is we cannot swap them around. However it's still very very flexible. Now if I want to go ahead and make adjustments. If I have a clip in the source area so the top part of the desktop and I double click to bring up the history like you've seen and we double tap on these areas you can see it says it cannot modify the source while the rendered clip exists in the source area. So kind of like my bin area this is where we store the clips and process them. This is not where we edit the history. If I wanted to edit the history of any clip the way it needs to be done is down here in the record area. The way this works is you'd simply take the clip that you're working with, we would place it down here in the record area and by double clicking on the clip you can expand it out into a timeline. You will see in the timeline it still has the H icon associated with it and I can access clip history in one of two ways. If I simply double tap on the H icon now it will take me to the topmost part of the history which was the last effect I used, that was text. If I then go here I can now either return which will then apply the changes I've made to the text or cancel any of the operations that I've made which will simply just take me back out. If I want to access the history again, once again you can just change the timeline view to look at the history view. So once again we're seeing exactly what we saw before. The difference is, is when I come to the color correction for example and I double click on it, it will launch me into the color corrector. So all the settings that I had done to make the color correction what it is now have now been loaded up into the color corrector. I have not had to reload a setting from somewhere else. I have not had to strip anything out the timeline. It's all still part of that very clip wherever you may be placing it. So to make an obvious change, let's say for example I simply just change the color correction and now if I hit return, Smoke will process the color correction. It then processes the text on top and you can see how the change has now applied itself in the clip history. So that's how you can modify history simply by double clicking on these operations. You go inside, you make your change and when you exit it will then process the current tool you've just adjusted and any of the history that happens afterwards. 
If you had done anything before, provided nothing changed as part of the history adjustments, it will remain the same. Nothing changes there. So you can go back to your timeline by pressing F5, and you can see that the history is still in that clip, but it has my changes being applied to it. So this is the first example in which you can actually use history to modify any of the things that you've done when actually creating the result that you have. Let's go ahead and have a look at something that may be a little bit more different. So I'm simply going to get rid of this clip that we're working with, and I'm now going to focus on this clip over here. So putting it down in the record area, and once again I'll expand out the timeline, you will see that there is an H icon on this clip as well. So there's history in here, but it's a dark H. The reason why the icon is dark rather than the one that was gray is this clip was produced with clip history and we kept only the sources, not the intermediate renders. This means that when I go ahead and I look, for example, at the history view, so we can look at the large history view, you can see that there's one action there that says unrendered. This means that there's only metadata here which created the results that has given us what we see in front of us. Now, the reason why I'm going to show you this one is because this example is very interesting. If we have a look at the actual final result, you can see that a number of sources and a number of operations were used to create this particular look. Now, this media is courtesy of WTHR, and this is part of the weather channel that they have. But one of the things, obviously, is when it comes to material, perhaps we need to reversion or recreate things. So one of the ways of working with clip history is to use it as a reversioning tool, even using it in the context of a timeline. So this, for example, could be my version 1. What we'll do here is simply by adding another layer, making a copy of this clip, I can copy it up to the second layer, you can see by copying the clip, it also copies the history that goes with it. So what I can do now is I can select the clip on the second layer, and we can then go ahead and look at the history inside of here. This time, it's kind of interesting because I can either jump, like you saw before, into the color warper, I can jump into one of the action tools and make a change. But I don't want to do that. What I, in fact, would like to do is I'd like to go ahead and change the element that is inside the TV screen. Now, this was four-point tracked, and you can see there's the element right here. So I could either enter into the action tool and make changes or go to the color warper and make changes to the metadata, but the other part of clip history is also the ability to swap out your sources. So if I was to double click on this little option here, you can see it brings up the new cursor and I can now choose what I would like to replace in the TV screen. So in this case, I'm going to use the smoke icon and then I'm also going to go ahead and replace the alpha as well. So you can see inside of clip history, it's updated the sources for me as well as unrendered everything that's happened from that point onwards. So now if I want to see the result that I've created, I can simply select the action that I would like to render and simply hit the render option. It will now begin to reprocess the history. So it's going to process the first action. It will then take the result of that action into the color warper and then process that result into another action, creating the effect I've done. So you can see the benefits of clip history. A, being able to adjust your settings, and B, being able to swap out sources. The one little thing just to know about sources is if you're going to be swapping out certain sources inside of clip history, make sure they're the same resolution because that will make it a very, very easy process to use. Once we've got our result, we can then carry on and maybe make another version if that is the necessity. But what it does mean now is inside the timeline, you can now see my history has been updated. If I look, I'm now looking at the second layer. You can see how we've now got the smoke icon inside the TV screens. And if I was to move up and down between the layers, you can see I've got version 1 and version 2. Interestingly enough, if we were to switch back to clip history one more time, you can see I'm looking currently at the topmost layer. If I push the down arrow, the focus point will move down to layer 1. Whatever the focus point is sitting on, it automatically gets selected. So if I was to push up and down, you can see how I'm able to look at the different history of each clip. Effectively, what I'm doing is if I press F5 to get back to the timeline, you can see I'm simply moving the focus point up and down with the arrows. So you can very easily see and make comparisons, but this is a fantastic tool if you're going to be versioning and maybe changing titles for commercials or updating something as you're busy working inside of the timeline as well. If you want to know any more information about Autodesk Smoke, or you'd like to download the free 30-day trial copy, just go to autodesk.com forward slash smoke for Mac.